He was my mentor. He worked many years uh, as a chairman of the Department of Talmology uh, at the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And uh, I had the chance, the privilege of being uh, one of his fellows. So it's really an honor for me always to, to introduce him. Uh, so if I'm here, it's also because of him, uh, of mainly because of him. Uh, he is now the director of the uh, Minimal Invasive Intraocular Surgery Institute in Lausanne and is a professor at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands. And uh, he will be talking about robotics in ophthalmology, which is a project that I remember it was started when I still That's was good. a fellow in MC. Mm -hmm. So I, I have followed for many years and I'm really proud that what Mark would achieve that now is a commercially available uh, product. And uh, I hope we will change the way we do with retinal surgery. Please, Mark. Well, thank you very much, Marco. And I'm sure it will change the way we do vitreous retinal surgery. And I hope that uh, you will, uh, uh, you yourself, Marco, but also in KCash, you'll be able to participate and help develop this over the years um, because it is a long term project and it always takes a long time before you're able to achieve these things. Now, why is it doing that? It worked perfectly. Still hear me, correct? Yes, yes, loud and clear. Okay, perfect. So um, we're going to talk about robotics for the coming uh, 45 minutes or so. And so what I'd like to do is to put it a bit into perspective and at the same time uh, then introduce the various systems that have been developed for ophthalmology and in particular the system that we've been working on for nearly now 14, 15 years. So robotics is around in surgery for already quite a while. In fact, when I first started with that, we, um, the Da Vinci system that you can see down below was already around. And there was this question of trying to introduce it into the Netherlands. But we see many other systems. One of the very early ones was called the Zeus surgical system that was around in the uh, 70s. Uh, you have some uh, devices that have been developed for neurosurgery, like the Neuromate, others that have been devised for uh, orthopedic surgery. And of course, in urology, gastroenterology, Da Vinci really is uh, one of the major uh, players. But if we really look at it, uh, we're at a time now where technology, whether it's artificial intelligence, uh, deep learning, even the way we look at OCT imaging in ophthalmology is changing quickly. And being able to use technologies such as robotics, for example, in, in performing surgery, I think is going to uh, be able to make use of all of these uh, new areas of technology. In fact, we have a project that hopefully will start very soon with some people in Greece with European funding to try and look at the application of artificial intelligence specifically to surgery and, uh, uh, and its potential use in improving the way the robot is able to function by learning as a person uses it and optimizing the way we do the surgery itself. Robotics is already part of our lives. It is part of surgery. It's also part of what we do already for probably 20, 25 years. If you think about heavy industries where there's a risk to humans, for example, in, uh, automation, in uh, doing automotives, a lot of it is being done by robotics. Unfortunately, certain companies like uh, um, Amazon want to make use of more and more robotics to try and reduce the use of individuals. And in fact, where robotics are best uh, applied and ad adopted is when they enhance our abilities or when they take over things that are dangerous. So for example, in areas of conflict and in assistive applications, that is where robotics has a big future support in body parts, replacing pr uh, a prosthesis if we're unable to do things. And with regards to uh, surgeries, as I'll show you, the higher precision that a robot provides is very useful for us because it extends our abilities in terms of being able to do surgery. Now, I'm certainly not the first. When I first gave a presentation on this subject, I got an email from Dr. Spitznatz that reminded me that in 1983, when I just finished medicine, he already had published an article on using a micromanipulator that was the forerunner to vitretinal surgery. And he, in his article, indicates that he's operated more than a thousand people with this system. However, he abandoned it. He abandoned it the moment we had micro instruments that were able to do surgery inside the eye. 
And for a very long time, uh, we didn't really need robotics because we had instruments that allowed us to do what we wanted to do. But as people now are talking about doing um, subretinal uh, sheet transfers, uh, gene therapy, the idea of doing a limited surgery inside the eye instead of doing a complete vitrectomy, then robotics will start having more and more role. They augment our surgical capacities. They uh, give us assisted positioning. For example, you could, and I, we've done this, and uh, Marco has tried it also, you can essentially just suspend whatever you're doing while you're thinking about uh, your next stage or exchange an instrument and come back to the exact same place you were. So assisted positioning changes the way you interact with your tissue and you're able to do surgery. We can limit hand tremor. We all have a tremor of about 100 microns and some people a bit less. Uh, my tremor is less than Marco's, but we can talk about that later. And, um, and we also, if we're trying to hold things precisely for a while, it becomes problematic because then we have micro jerks. And I'll show you a, a graph that shows that. But for every single possibility we have, it also brings a, uh, a challenge. Augmenting surgical uh, uh, capabilities is fine, but to do that, we have to introduce things like filtering to remove hand tremor, which may in fact change the rapidity with which we get a, a response from the robot. And so as the robot does certain function for us, it has to remain intuitive. The surgeon should not have to feel that he has a long learning curve in order to uh, learn how to use the robot. And uh, so things such as motion stop and target suspension are all things we can do, but we have to be careful that it makes our life easier and not that we have to uh, have a long uh, learning curve. So these are the challenges. We want something that is ergonomic, that is with the right design, that doesn't impact too much both on the patient and on the way we do surgery. It should fit with existing um, uh, surgical suites if we can, instead of having to have another design. It of course has to be safe, that's uh, absolute given. And then we have to use about uh, use, and I've already in some ways introduced the fact that one of our biggest fears is that we can devise, devise all of this, but are you going to be willing to adopt it? So this is Da Vinci, fantastic machine if you're doing abdominal surgery. I'm surprised you can do very good uh, urology with it, but it is possible. But you see that it has a huge footprint. and. Just try to think uh, that you're going to use these instruments to do ocular surgery. It isn't really designed for that purpose. If we look at the main approaches for vitreoretinal surgery, these are, or for eye surgery, these are the ones that have been thought of over the years. You can have an assisted handheld device as is shown in the middle, in which case you have a device that is able to stabilize what you're doing and, and, and compensate for some of your deficiencies but it means that each instrument has to be fitted in there and there has to be a very fast um, uh, background loop that analyzes what you're doing and compensates for it. So it's a very intuitive, simple design, but complicated to uh, manufacture to get into uh, uh, general use. Co-manipulation is the next level. In this case, the robot assists or limits your motions and directs you in a specific direction. So if you wanted to cannulate, for example, a vein, which uh, this has been used for, it does work. And the uh, third system, which is more complex because you have to work with a computer, make sure that it does what the surgeon wants to do is telemanipulation. And here, in fact, you use a joystick to essentially get a, what we call the slave to do the surgery itself. And this is, in fact, what we've chosen. Here are the advantages of a handheld system. It can filter tremor. It can improve static tasks, so just uh, uh, drug uh, uh, delivery. It is very intuitive in use, but it has a lot of deficiencies. You can't scale. It doesn't have what's called the remote center of motion, so it can't, in fact, orient itself within the eye and tell you where you are, and it does nothing with regards to eye stability. Co-manipulation is better. As you can see, there are more pluses. But it does, it isn't all that intuitive. It does tend to limit what you do and a rapid exit in terms of safety is somewhat more complicated to achieve. And where you do, uh, uh, so this is the, but it does assist the surgeon. It can help to filter uh, and uh, fit with appropriate instruments. And uh, one of the tasks where it was proven to work
to build a fully uh, robotic system uh, that is teleoperated. And this is in fact a, a video from um, company Minutia that shows how their system could potentially be used to get into the eye and perform uh, the surgery and be able to cannulate. But it does very small directed motions, limits what you're able to do uh, for this particular purpose. Telemanipulation uh, covers all of the elements that are mentioned here. It can have a rapid exit, it filters tremor. You can adapt it to various type of applications. So, um, you know, it, it essentially the computer will translate the commands that you give to the robot in a master slave design. So you can get it to peel, you can get it to cannulate, you could inject through the retina. And I'll show you some of the examples of what we've tried to develop over the last few years. This is essentially the basic principle. On the left, you have the slave that is essentially controlled by a robotic arm. And you use a, uh, a uh, motion controller on the right. And one of the big advantages is as you manipulate the tip of that motion controller, you're in fact at the very tip of your instrument. At least as a vitreotrial surgeon, we always work at a distance, but here you get the feeling that you're just at the level of the tissue. And as we develop this further in the future for anterior segment surgery, the same would be true if you're trying to do glaucoma surgery. Instead of being at a distance to reach, for example, the uh, trabecular meshwork where you want to place your tube, you would be just at the level of the trabecular meshwork as you're placing it. So you get extreme stability and control of your movement. And that's one of the big advantages of trying to use a tele-manipulation system. Precision is very high, it's under 10 microns. In fact, I'll show you that we have data that shows that it's under two microns. It filters tremors, it fill, it's uh, motion scales, so it's intuitive, which is important for the surgeon. We can exchange instruments, and it has this positional stability in memory, which means that we can set boundaries beyond which you, you can't reach, so it's safe. You can also advance by certain steps, which allows you to advance in a safe way towards the retina or potentially within the retina or elsewhere. And for those people who have tried it so far, well, they find that it causes less strain. They can keep a more restful position while they do the surgery. It's less stressful. And because of some of the function I've mentioned, the motion stop where you can't go beyond a certain area, the fact that it can help you to position in a given pl a place and you can suspend tasks, think about what you want to do and go to the next uh, step. It has a large operative reach. That's the way it was designed. We designed it from the ground up so that it would be able to do vitreoretinal surgery. And as you can see on the right, we clip onto uh, the trocars. And that was probably uh, um, a very good choice because the fact of choosing that as a reference point gives us a very high precision about what we're doing into the eye. You'll notice on the left that we don't reach all the way anteriorly. The idea was to try and avoid the lens but give us a very large reach inside, uh, both from a nasal as well as a temporal side. So far, we've only developed the temporal arm and we haven't really looked at the nasal part. But in theory, um, we can reach about 90% of uh, uh, eyes, also from the nasal side think, uh, and the orbital rim. We've, uh, we've designed this and modeled it based on uh, a, a, a European person from the very far north to the very south. These are experiments we did looking at static positioning. So you see on the left uh, robotic, you see that uh, the five micron uh, uh, steps and the, uh, the vibration you see there has largely to do with the fact that where the robot was placed on the table, there was a little bit of vibration. It wasn't completely steady. And that small blip has to do with the fact that somebody just hit the side of the table at the time that the experiments were being done. When you do the same thing with humans, you can see what a hundred micron looks like and you see a lot of overshoots. And that has to do with the fact that if you're trying to do something statically, inject through the, uh, for example, the retina into the subretinal space, your body was built essentially to move. And so if you stay steady for a while, every so often, you're going to have what's called a micro jerk. And these are very often between 250 and 300 microns in amplitude. If we move and, uh, and you're trying now to make a step from one position to another, 
the robot you see has a very slight delay of a few milliseconds as you tell it to do something. In humans, it's about the same, and we still have all that variation in height uh, between, uh, in terms of position. One of the key elements for performing vitreoretinal surgery or performing eye surgery in general as compared to what you might want to do inside an abdomen, and I would even say without, uh, with regards to neurosurgery, is that we require more than just uh, high precision. High precision can mean, as you see in the top right-hand corner, that you always come to the right spot, but you may be off from where you need to be because you might have low accuracy. And most systems that have been developed have either talked about accuracy or precision, but for us in our field, we need both. We need that lower right target. Essentially, we need high accuracy and precision. And you can see what we're talking about also on the left. When you're high accurate and highly precise in your positioning, you can follow a square and always remain on it. While above, you can follow a square, you can create a very nice cube but you're not quite on target. And this is what you often get when you're trying to do surgery uh, abdominally. These are the results of experiments that were done uh, a few years ago that show robotic performance versus human. So if you just let the robot uh, recreate some of the things I showed you just before, we see a precision and accuracy in dynamic tasks of about one to three microns. So high precision during motion. Well, if we look at human performance, it's a lot less. It's about 10 times less. And experience with regards to X, Y doesn't seem to be all that important, which um, as a experienced vitreoretinal surgeon that has trained people, and I'm sure Marco would agree with me, is in fact a bit of a bummer because to get these young people that come along and when you look at them tra track within the eye, they do virtually as well as we do except that when you're looking at depth perception, which requires, in fact, fine motor skills inside your hands, your fingers, particularly the index and thumb, there is a difference. Experience makes a difference. And this has also been uh, shown um, uh, in clinic by uh, a group in Toronto where they assess the abilities of their uh, fellows as compared to the attendings and saw their a major difference. Adoption, well, we need real solutions, so let's talk about that. And uh, here are some examples. This is the cannulation of a vein done a few years ago in a pig, where you can see that there's hardly any motion. This 60 micron diameter a catheter is brought into a vein and we're filling up the vein with fluid. And we've left it in place in a live pig for up to about 20 minutes. The light source was on the side. You can see that we're backfilling the, uh, the veins. This is a repetition of the same video. We did this in part because we were interested in trying to get rid of occlusion. So we uh, cannulated the vein here, injected uh, uh, ocrutasmin, by the way, or jetrea, and you can see that you can get rid of a clot extremely quickly. And when we pull out, and I'm not sure that we're showing it here, there is a tiny bit of bleeding, as you can see, because of, and you can get rid of that by just increasing your pressure. But again, cannulating, remaining there in place, positioning it just above the vein is easy to do. We don't even need to do a vitrectomy in this case. You can go right to the spot where you want to go and then just uh, do the injection. And we've developed a program that allows us to pierce through the first uh, um, uh, wall of the vein and then retract immediately so that don't we, we don't pierce through. Veins in the eye are exactly as they are on your, on your hand. If you want to cannulate, you need a tourniquet because you need uh, to swell up the vein, otherwise you collapse it. We can't turn the key, put a tourniquet here, but we can devise something that allows us to go in and retract and prevent um, double penetration, and that works. This is uh, in Oxford, where the first time a human was ever operated. The motion you see is from the anesthesia, and here the needle is going to approach the surface of the retina and initiate the, uh, a flap so that it can be peeled. And even in these first set of patients that were done and published uh, in Nature uh, um, Biological Engineering, the uh, results show that there are fewer hemorrhages when you're using the robotic system as compared to uh, doing it in humans. Here we're showing some experiments that uh, were done during your retina in 2018. We now have a simulator that is connected to the robotic arm. And these are surgeons, uh, this is an Australian, that came and just tested the system during uh, Uretna when they had some a few minutes. 
we didn't get trained them very much, but uh, allowed them first to play around with the system. And then after that, asked them to participate in a, a mini study. And in our mini study, we created the virtual bound at the level of the retina, and then looked at the number of times that a retinal injury occurred. So retinal injuries occurred in the IC simulator if you touch the retina and they give you, they show up as either small hemorrhages or as the presence of uh, red spots. And we looked at the numbers that occurred when they did it manually or when they used a robot in order to do the surgery. And you can see here that both in the macula as well as extra macular locations, there were more injuries and, ver and none in fact when you use the robot. And, an article was published uh, along those lines, and it shows, in fact, that and by regards to surgical time, we don't do quite as well. It demands more time, but the range covers about the same area as what you have manually. And so what has been told years ago by one of the engineers in da uh, that worked on Da Vinci, she said that if you want really to optimize the use of a robot, you have to think as a robot. That is to say, in this case, if we place a bound at the level of the retina, we don't need to approach the retina very slowly. We can go directly to that bound because we know that we're not going to penetrate. In this case, the bound was placed a little bit under the surface of the retina, so you still had to be a little bit more careful when you came very close to the surface. But if a person does that, the amount of time required to do surgery decreases dramatically. There are, uh, in terms of the manipulations, the number of times you open and close the, uh, the instruments, it was the same for both. But you'll notice that with regards to hemorrhages, they're less, they're not uh, completely eliminated, but definitely less. Uh, and uh, there are no retinal injuries in the case of the robot. There are some that occurred with, when it was done uh, manually. So this is a video that shows you essentially uh, a peel. So manually, you can end up hitting the retina in the periphery. <coughs> Sorry, and if you do it robotically, it, uh, you can induce your peel. It takes a little bit of time, but as you pull laterally, the, uh, the device itself will prevent you from being able to hit. So you can go a little bit faster and you don't end up hitting the retina as you get close to it. This is the setup inside the OR. As I told you at the very beginning, what is important is to have a setup that is uh, as non-intrusive as possible, preferably that fits in an existing OR, and this is what we've tried to create. So this is the setup in uh, 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 Oxford. You can see here the headrest, the instrument manipulator. This is a specific headrest that has to be placed on the table. It's an integral part of the robotics system. The micro manipulator sits here on the side. We've simplified the holder at this stage. The patient fits uh, in here, is brought in. You have to position the head correctly. And while you're not using the robot itself, you can carry out your surgery the way you normally will, would. And then you bring the robot in as in D and E at the moment you really want to use it. You can keep using your regular uh, um, uh, light pipe and carry out the surgery you want to do. So the surgeon uses the system to assist him in those tasks where he feels that it really adds something, but can carry out doing surgery using the same microscope, the same setup as you've done in the past. In the future, we may well go to a system that would be able to use an integrated video system and do it independently, but we want to do things stepwise and first get people used to it. This is the setup in uh, Rotterdam. We use a fleece to hold the head in place so that it can't move. Surgeries have been done in Oxford also under local anesthesia and have been done successfully. And you can see more or less how people can be uh, located around the, uh, uh, in their standard position as they're doing surgery. Here the robot is being positioned or the micro manipulator in place and the surgeon is using the, uh, the uh, remote control to try and direct it. Better seen here, as he's moving the motion, uh, 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 motion controller, the robot moves and the uh, motions themselves are adjusted based on where he's located inside the eye, so that when you're far away, it will move quickly, and when you're close to the retinal surface, it goes slowly. 
This is something we're developing at present, which is a probe that contains an OCT scan. And the top is the back side of the probe, that's the line above. And we're getting closer and closer to the retinal surface. And I think one thing you'll appreciate here is first of all, the stability. But secondly, the fact that we're seeing these blips and these blips correspond to two things. These are heartbeats. And if you think about it, each time the heart uh, will compress, the ventricle compresses, the choroid fills, which causes the retina to move forward. That motion is about six to 10 microns in amplitude. And each time a person breathes, that adds an amplitude of about 20 microns. So you can find yourself between 40 and 60 micron motion back and forth of the retina just due to physiologic uh, parameters which we don't see on standard OCTs because the OCT that we see is essentially a realignment of A scan OCTs that are where you use the surface and the RPE as a point of reference in order to be able to line them up. So heartbeats 15 to 50, and as I've mentioned, the heart rate does the same thing. We haven't fully developed this, but we think that this will add safety in terms of doing surgery. So we'd like to have instruments along these lines. And the other thing that it will also add is the ability to, for example, enter the retina to a specific depth and be able to do surgery in this way. <coughs> in um, Euretina this past year, we've made a simulation of what subretinal injections might look like. And so you see this here where where uh, on the left side, the robot is positioned to go through the, um, this uh, gelatin with a, um, a paper thin layer under. And on the right, you see the amount of jitteriness you would get as you try to do it yourself. And manually, you always get some degree of uh, reflux, while with the robot, there may be a little bit of reflux, but very little. And you get the formation of this bleb that uh, occurs under what, um, within the uh, structure that we uh, uh, created here, which is a simulated retina. We've used an uh, OCT pig model to try and create um, a simulated uh, subretinal hemorrhage. Uh, so this is in pigs, sorry, that is looking at subretinal injections using an IOCT. And what you can see here essentially is the injection. We, we can position it very well inside the, uh, the retina. And sorry? Oh my God, I'm sorry if you're, maybe we can cut this. It's working, it's, it's fine. Yeah, it's just that you're hearing the background the sound, which you shouldn't, so I'm sorry, because I took this from the Arvo presentation of one of my PhD students, Reza. And what uh, he's shown in a uh, uh, ex vivo model is the fact that we're able to inject into the subretinal space and using the, um, we can create a bleb using the robot in 100% of cases with relatively little leakage. While if you're doing it manually, uh, you very often see leakage uh, in 100% of cases and bleb creation occurs in about 40%. So there's a huge difference between the two. And as we're getting more and more towards uh, doing um, gene therapy, this can make a big difference in terms of outcome. So the last part I want to talk about is about safety and uh, mitigating risk. So we've all heard about the uh, uh, Boeing and it's 737 MAX 8 and the problems they've had. And I hope that at no stage in precise, uh, for certainly as long as I'm involved, and beyond will ever get a situation like this. And mitigating risk you can do in different ways. First of all, it's important to know where the risk is located if you're going to get into robotic surgery. And largely it comes from inadequate training and communication failure. Equipment failure is always a possibility. And in fact, there is a site from the FDA where you can see all of the failures that have occurred with things such as Da Vinci and there are parts in Da Vinci that are made of rubber, and occasionally this rubber falls into the operative field. This won't happen with uh, the precise system because everything is outside the eye. The only thing that goes in are instruments similar to what we do when we go inside the eye. Sorry. <coughs> Equipment failure, there are many failback measures that we've put in. Of course, if there is a power failure, that um, would mean that everything stops. 
But even in those circumstances with power failure, the weight system inside the robot is, is such that everything will slowly pull out of the eye and not stay inside the eye. So it is uh, quite safe from that standpoint. And with regards to position and movement of the patient, I'll come back to that a little bit later. Training is obviously important, and we do have a training that has worked very well with about uh, now uh, six, uh, between six and 10 surgeons before they've uh, uh, used the robotic system in patients. There are 20 patients operated so far with uh, this system. Uh, you've seen already that the simulator is a good way to be able to show what the robot can do, but it's also a good way to train, and we're going to develop that further. That's part of what we're trying to do with AI, is to be able to develop a simulation that would be similar to what happens in humans, and hopefully in the future, as we're doing more and more human cases, we can bring it back to the simulator. What I'm hoping is that in some ways, uh, in the distant future, we do most of our surgery using a robot, but we train on the simulator to do new things or to, if there's a procedure we haven't done for a while, we can first do it there and then carry it over to the patient. So training is important. Human error, which is mainly communication between nursing staff, technical staff, and the surgeon can be part of the problem. But robot-specific things are relatively rare. And so we're spending a lot of time now trying to understand in an OR setting, where are the problems in communication for the nurses in understanding how things work, how the communication between the surgeon and the nurse takes place, and, uh, and then also this question of the communication with the support technical staff inside a hospital. For most, this may be new to you, but uh, as I got involved with uh, robotics and we tried to get our CE mark, we had to go through a, uh, a exercise called FEMA, which is a way of reducing the amount of uh, the risk to the patient or in the use of a device. And so we look at whether a risk is acceptable or not, and that has to do with um, whether it's going to have um, dire consequences. So unacceptable would be, for example, something that blinds a person or requires multiple surgeries to be able to repair. If you just, for example, have a conjunctival hemorrhage, that might be considered uh, an inexorable uh, complication since we see this in, in surgery today also. And so you start with uh, the, the risk and you find ways to mitigate or reduce it either by design, by the software we put into the, uh, into the computer, and also by testing how things are being done so that we can reduce the way um, uh, the risk that can occur to the patient. So we break down surgeries in steps and we re reassemble them so that they become more efficient and safe. What we're showing here is the fact that we can trace everything that occurs during surgery in terms of time and in terms of position, how deep we go within the, the eye. And so as we as we try to improve what we do, we go back and look at what has been done in the past. We've used this <clears throat> in uh, some external work we did for a company where we were trying to get through the choroid. And when I did this manually for them, I would do a rotary motion to try and get through the choroid and minimize bleeding. We were trying to inject helon into the subretinal space from an external approach. However, when we were using the robot, we figured out that we would get less bleeding and be more efficient if we tried to scratch between the choroidal vessels. And as we would go deeper, we would scratch horizontally and then a little bit vertically because the orientation of the vessel changes. And all of this is, of course, fine with the robot because of its precision, but we never, I never appreciated when I did this manually. AI, we're going to use recordings uh, and lead to partial automation. The uh, surgeon will always be in the lead. He's going to control what is being done. Um, we're looking at the possibility of adding haptic feedback. That could be, that is a feedback that tells you as you're getting into danger zone, going to do something that might be dangerous, that it could stop you while you're using the uh, joystick. It tells you that you have to stop, or it could be auditory warning, tell you that you're getting too close, for example. What is best still has to be uh, determined, but this is something that we'll do as time goes by. In our current directions is to try and develop some new software that are going to enhance the procedures, looking at vision integration with uh, the use of uh, the, uh, an endoscope, heads-up displays. Uh, as you've seen, we're looking at the use of 
OCTs or the IOCT for existing uh, microscopes to try and enhance the way things are done. We want to integrate the OCT inside the instrument so that it increases the degree of safety. I mentioned I would also, and with regards to safety, we've looked at the use of, for example, uh, fleeces to hold the patient in place. And one often question is, yeah, but what happens if a patient moves? Right now, when we use the robot, we use it for very specific tasks. It's a bit like trying to do a very fine peel at the surface of a retina or removing a subretinal membrane when we used to do that. And I've done quite a few of these surgeries of patient awake. And when it comes to a critical point, I tell the patient we're doing something critical, stay awake, stay attentive, don't uh, you know, move. And I've always been able to carry out the surgery under those circumstances. Those cases that were done under local with the robot are similar. That is to say that when it was being used, the patient has a, a high level of uh, interest. You tell him that he needs to uh, fixate at a specific position and he does that. You're not doing a full surgery under robotics. In the future, we may want to do that. And if you look at what has been published so far, and I think out of your own experience, we get more problems very often under general anesthesia where all of a sudden a, a person starts to uh, uh, respond to his, uh, if he's intubated to his tube and a lot less under local anesthesia. Under local, it's people that fall asleep that all of a sudden become uh, awake and that you can deal with by, um, by getting patients to remain uh, you know, attentive during surgery. The robot itself inside the joystick does have a function that if you were to see a person move and you uh, jolt back on the joystick as if you were removing an instrument, it will remove the instrument within uh, about 10 to 20 milliseconds. So it's within the same range of time that you would do yourself while you're doing surgery. So I think, you know, inherently it's relatively, it, it is safe and could be used. What about the future? Well, uh, short term as uh, Precise is trying to lease the instrument. So we've tried in the past to, to, uh, to sell it, but it is a machine that is handmade at this stage. It uh, has to be done uh, when we receive a order and it's in the order 400 to 500,000 euros. So it's not cheap, but it's of course a full robotic system. We have now uh, a system that is going to the US. We have an, uh, a CE mark on the system, so it can be sold or leased in Europe. And we're working on getting FDA approval, which should change uh, very much our approach for the future. Uh, we've, I've mentioned we're trying to integrate the OCT system and we're looking at uh, more long term at using AI. And because it's a very compact system and if we build in the vi visualization either in instruments or from a distance, we could also think about moving eye surgery out of standard ORs and putting it more into office based solutions which in some ways I think is the future of ophthalmology. So, you know, um, we're working on it. We've been working on it for about 14 years. Um, I think we're getting closer to a system that can be deployed. And I hope that you'll all be want to be part of this, uh, this revolution in terms of how surgery is done. It's been 10 years and it's a very small team that has worked on it. Uh, Garrett is our CEO. As you can see, most of them are extremely young people. Uh, Martin is mainly our integration engineer. Uh, Tice has developed a lot of the, uh, the, uh, the robot itself and the systems that go on it and the coupling systems. Uh, we have some advisors with regards to regulatory affairs. Um, Martin Steinbuch was uh, the uh, professor that along with me developed this system early on and uh, we have some business advisors also. So innovation is the calling card of the future. I think this is the innovation that will get us there. And um, uh, I hope you like this presentation and I'm open to any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Mark. I mean, it's always very interesting to hear your lectures. And uh, of course, nobody can say you are not an innovator and uh, you showed it in all your career with everything you you came up with. And um, this is really the, the, the work of many years and uh, I'm really happy to see that now it's going very well, actually, that you are going even to US, I think. Where, where, is you, where are you putting your machine now? 
So the, uh, it's in uh, Mount Sinai, so New York Ioneer. We're hoping to install it uh, early, uh, sometime between July and September, depending on what COVID will allow us to do. Mm -hmm. And um, as soon as we get there, we're going to try and uh, get FDA approval. Uh, developing things like this demands money in a certain sense. And, you know, beyond that, uh, if you guys have ideas, I think that's going to be the time to uh, come up with them. You know, uh, we could certainly drain things under the retina. There is a company that has approached me and asked me if we could go and, and sample, for example, cysts inside the retina. Because we have a precision of one to two microns, virtually anything is possible. It's just a question of wanting to do it. Yeah, this is basically like the starting the tip of the iceberg because as soon as you start using it, it will be a lot more procedure you will discover to do it, not only for retina surgery, but for other applications also, you know? Absolutely. If we think, for example, of trying to put tubes in glaucoma, um, I don't know if you've tried to use the Xen. I've used it on a few occasions and... Uh, um, you get the technical skill of knowing more or less where you need to be, but it's still a blind procedure. You know, here, if you have a, a small uh, uh, endoscope and it shows you where you need to be, you can spend time trying to get it to the right spot and then just uh, place it to the depth you want, uh, to the extent you want, because you control every step of the uh, procedure. If I mean, look you're, you're mentioning something very important, which is precision. I think this robot, the biggest difference, I think, probably is in the Z-axis, as you mentioned, you know, to be able to understand where you are going, how deep you are going, and also to put your boundaries. So that is safety, because you know exactly that you are not going to damage structure. You already pre-imposed pre these measurements in your machine, and you know you cannot go further than that. That yeah, is what so, of course, right? Precision is very important and counterintuitively, the fact that time isn't an essence anymore makes a difference. If you think about, for example, for those high precise uh, steps that you want to do subretinal injection, we have to do it fairly quickly. And all publications so far tell us that, you know, as you inject, you're losing 40 to 50%. And I'm sure, Marco, that when you've injected subretinal hemorrhages, on occasion, you've seen some of the blood come back around the area where you're injecting sure. because you do it fairly fast. You don't have a choice. But here, if you want to take half an hour, you can. So you can be much more secure about what you're doing. The other is an interesting uh, idea is uh, you might have heard, for example, with epiretinal membranes when we peel, there are always micro hemorrhages here and there. And these small hemorrhages, uh, some people are thinking, are places where we uh, evolve the um, uh, neurovascular uh, uh, network. And maybe we can get to a stage where we can peel, we can hold it and sort of do a very fine dissection and end up getting much better results. Maybe we can do it without developing all of these, uh, you know, uh, superficial changes as we peel an epiretinal membrane. And while it doesn't seem to have that much of an influence in terms of final vision, in people that have lost vision, it might make a difference in terms of reading speed because now you won't get these uh, these losses in terms of the um, the uh, you know um, uh, visual field in these areas. So I think this opens up new horizons in ways that we do surgery so that we can improve it. You know, I remember when we used, for example, trimcinolone, um, we had macular edema and uveitis. We'd use trimcinolone, and I was very happy because I got rid of the edema, but there was no improvement in vision. Then came along things such as uh, Osodex, and all of a sudden, I saw improvements in vision that I hadn't seen before. So this, I think, is going to be the same. As we find applications and people like you start using it, we're going to see where it makes a difference and decide when the technology really is useful and when it's not. Um, and for sure what you said, I mean, especially when you do subretinal injection, and nowadays with all these cellular therapies coming out and gene therapy and viral vectors, I think this makes a huge difference because yeah. you don't know what's going on with the virus that you are basically spreading around the retina. You want to have it concentrated under it. And uh, I mean, you cannot do this with the bare end, in spite I have very little tremor, much less than you, as you know. But uh, well, we, that's debatable, Marco, <laughs> but we can do that offline, I think. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. Look, I think they see somebody raise the end. Um, wait a sec. Is Adel, you there? Hello? Ah, Abdullah, yes, you raise your hand, please, go ahead. You have a question. Uh, uh, 
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Marco and Dr. Aguirre for this nice presentation. I'm very grateful for uh, uh, Professor Mark uh, De Smith for this is futuristic presentation. Do you still hear me? Yes, yes, I do. Because I do. I do. Hear you, hear you, Abdullah. My question, yeah, my question because the screen disappeared a little bit. My question is, you you propose a robotic surgery. It seemed to be pure for ophthalmology because you know there is some surgical uh, robotic surgery like the Vinci, which is could be used for multiple uh, surgical speciality, urology, head and neck, general surgery, many things. Do you find it a little bit difficult to market uh, for marketing? I mean, to bring a robotic special for ophthalmology only for ophthalmology, which costs a lot. And do you think it would be even practical to have like an adaptive uh, re in, uh, hardware and software? on the one which has already existed in the market? Well, for the ones that exist on the market, the, uh, the problem for ophthalmology is access and size. So, you know, that's why I think, you know, people have tried the Da, da Vinci for uh, ophthalmology. Its precision is about to the level of um, 100 microns. So it doesn't get much better than what we're able to do. And you can use it for cornea, but it doesn't add very much and it's very costly. But if I take your question and were to apply it to the robot we've developed, uh, yes, we could probably, any place where we could have a point of fixation, we could use this robot to do that kind of surgery. The difficulty is that uh, to do these other things, you need money to invest into that area and you need people that can help you to do it. So the key for any company or anybody who wants to do something like this in the future is focus, 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 start on one thing. And you know, while the big market in ophthalmology would be cataracts, you know, we avoided cataracts because we first wanted to make sure we had a very good, precise system that did the surgery the way we wanted. And to do cataracts, we also then need to develop the, uh, the visualization part which we didn't really have the funding for. So maybe that's going to be a next stage. I think you should see precise as being something that starts with eyes. And if somebody later comes along and says, I want to use it for the knee, or I want to use it for the brain or for the ear, we can certainly look at you know, something like that and try to adapt it. Or even I think you could do certain types of abdominal surgery if you had the right type of setup uh, around the, uh, where we could place the device. But that goes beyond our abilities in terms of team and the money we have. But it's a good question. Thank you. Thank you all. It was an excellent futuristic uh, webinar. Thank you. I do have a question. Uh, sure. My understanding is that uh, for giving a subretinal injection, are you proposing that we actually cut the surgery into not doing a vitrectomy and then going and give, giving the injection precisely under the subretinal uh, space. Uh, I, I think this, this by itself is a very, uh, is, is, uh, is a, an, an added advantage that would, would definitely uh, let us uh, do things in a very different way. I think we can. Um, the, the, there are a few things. I've, I've done that in fact, in pigs with cells for a company years ago. Uh, more than 10 years ago, I did a lot of experiments. You can find one of my publications on superchordial delivery, which was the ultimate uh, uh, thing that we tried. Um, to do that, you can. You can get into the subretinal space, but you still need to decompress the vitreous. So somewhere you need to do a small vitrectomy, I think. Now with the robot, maybe it's not necessary because you can inject slowly while you know the, uh, some of the fluid will be reabsorbed through the anterior chamber. So it might be a moot point. But yes, I think you could get to the right spot, tell the robot, go right into this area. You know, do the, uh, we've already tested ex vivo and we can now inject in the subretinal space and get absolutely no leakage with the closure of the, uh, the retina. So you could get it to where you want, do your injection, and then pull out. But if you want to be even more futuristic, you want to transfect the, art, the uh, uh, rods and cones. And maybe in the future, depending on the disease, you want to transfect the uh, mutor cells. So if you have a much tinier needle, if you have a, a nano needle, do you really need to cause a retinal detachment? You know, if you take patients with very severe disease, 
causing the detachment is very difficult. What if we were to do a thousand uh, injections with a, uh, a minute needle? Now we're talking futuristic. Uh, I'm, uh, what I've shown you so far, we can do. We can do tomorrow in a patient. But this, if, if you can inject to the right depth inside the retina, and you inject a, uh, a, uh, a microliter, you don't need to detect the retina. You could do multiple injections. I think we have- I a, see your brain thinking, that's good. A qu question from Dr. Marcos uh, Rubio. He's asking about the calibers that you use in, in the instruments. Uh, in, in this We've, when I, we started with this project, uh, my first requirement was that we could do 25G. So uh, we've tested 25, which means that we can do larger for sure. We haven't tried it with 27, but we could certainly do 27. The key here is that we can fit it onto a, a, a we use the uh, trocar as an entry point. So whatever fits in the trocar can be used. Mark, that means that you can use even smaller in theory because you have the fulcrum in the trocar without having flexi, fle flexion of the instruments when you go around. Well, you will, if you've done your vitrectomy, you won't have flexion. In fact, one of the things I thought early on as we started developing it was, uh, as you remember, with the 25G early, as yes. you went in one direction, it would bend. And I thought, yeah. you know, we could use the robot. We would know the kind of bend it does and just take advantage of that. So we've uh, never had to do that. But um, um, if the catheter is too small, so if we go back to the glass catheters, I've inser inserted them in uh, maybe 80 or 90 times in intact vitreous, and then it only broke once. So it tells you that if you're going into a straight direction <coughs> and you're not creating any torque, the glass won't break. And uh, that was always one of the arguments in not using glass catheters to try and do things inside the eyes, that if you tried, it would break and then you'd have to remove the, uh, the uh, you know, broken pieces. In that particular case in the pig, I did remove them and that worked very well. You just get a needle and you suck the piece out and it's gone and you can complete your vitrectomy. But in principle, yes, you can go in with a glass catheter of 60 microns in diameter in an intact vitreous, get into a vein, inject and pull out and have nothing break. And that's because the robot goes in and out and it doesn't create torque as it moves around. We would, you know, just by the way we manipulate. We might avoid it in many cases, but we won't be able to avoid it in all. And the stability here allows you to do that. Mark, is there now a robot in such a point that you can do semi-automated maneuver? Can you tell him, for example, to go in like three micron from the retina and punch through, or cannot you do that? Yes, yeah, so what we, uh, what we already do now, but for that you need a video system. So uh, in the simulations we did in uh, Uretna, that was already the case. You would position it on top of the, uh, the gelatin, get it to advance, and you would do it in steps. What we have right now on loan is an IOCT, so we can get to the surface of the retina, position the uh, catheter, programmed so that it uh, advances by 150 microns and the tip will advance 150 microns and then you can judge whether that's deep enough. And if you think it's deep enough, you can start injecting and otherwise you can advance by another step, whichever you want to choose, 10 microns, 50 microns, 25 microns, and it will advance by that amount and it will stay there. And then you can judge and say, okay, this is good and we continue. So this you can do just pushing the button on the joystick or? The no, this uh, we also, I didn't show you, I guess that's a mistake on my part. There's also a screen and on the screen you can put instructions in. So some of it you can do with a joystick or with a foot pedal or otherwise you use the screen. And if you want high precision movements, it's better to program in what you want. So you do this on the screen and you tell it, go ahead. So basically the semi-automated maneuver already nowadays. Yes, you can have a semi-automated maneuver now. Or you could, for example, use a memory function where you're doing something and you want to come back. So one of the things we've looked at is, for example, air fluid exchange. And uh, if you know where the position is of the optic nerve and you set up a good safe distance, 50 microns, for example, and you uh, put in all the dye you want, you can essentially uh, tell the robot to go back above the optic nerve at the set position and just suck all of that out without having to worry that, you know, you're not seeing what you're doing, it's going to do it for you. 
Wow, so I see the face of my, my younger colleague, Dr. Achille, there. He said, I studied all my life, I'm now a young consultant. It means I'm going to be jobless now if this goes to <laughs> Exactly. Do they have to be, have no, to no, be no, a No, 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 Abdullah, you have to see it differently. Is that now you're going to be as good as Marco. <laughs> 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 and while we're joking, you know, if you look at, because I looked at this a few years ago, if you look at what happened in urology, you know, that's one of the problems I have too, is that you approach people, for example, and they, tell, they want to speak to KOLs. So, you know, for Marco, for me, we don't really need a robot to do the surgery. And so in urology, they had the same thing. They asked, you know, the older generation, Marco, and so they, they came to the conclusion that, you know, no, I don't need a robot. I do my surgery perfectly well. But when they went to the younger generations, they all loved the robots to do uh, prostatectomies. Why? Because the degree of bleeding they had with the robot was about the same that their masters had doing it manually. And so the adoption among young people was much faster. You know, being able to peel, getting close to the retinal surface, all of that was facilitated would be facilitated. In their case, they avoid having bleeding. So adoption with young people was fairly quick. So it won't take work away from you. It will make you as good as your masters. <laughs> I, I, so you were, you were talking earlier about having this procedure later on being performed in office because you basically say uh, you would limit, limit the, 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 the number of people you need around the I mean, even having the surgeon exactly in the same place where, where everything is happening. So, so, so is this, I mean, um, does this add, in your opinion, I mean, any value to, to what we'll be doing in, in our practice, meaning that? Uh, well, it may or may not. Um, I think there is a general trend. You're starting your career. I'm getting closer to the end of it. And uh, when I started, I still have many years. And Marco, don't be worried. Um, uh, you already, I, already 10 years ago you were at the end so oh my god <laughs> listen to this guy we've had this debate forever you know he's getting closer to the end um, when we when um, when I was a resident a cataract was worth about $400 in Canada that's where I trained in Switzerland is it worth 2000 when I came here to Switzerland the price had gone down to about the 400 and uh, two years ago the ministry decided that the official price for cataract was now 70 Swiss francs. It cost me more money to go and get my hair cut. <laughs> and while that seems extreme, it's not the price we get because there are agreements now with clinics. The fact is, is there's a general trend to reduce the cost of uh, surgery, the cost to you as a physician. But the surgical fee, for example, in Switzerland has not gone down and the clinic where you do surgery gets just about the same amount as they did two years ago. Why? Mm -hmm. Because that's uncompressible. So the way I look at it is as we have more and more pressures and um, unfortunately I think Saudi Arabia may face this also in the future if the price of oil goes down or the use is less, mm -hmm. there's going to be less reimbursement but the clinic has certain fees. So if you can move it to your office, you'll be able to continue doing things and for your career it will be covered. Good. I start liking it also now, you see? Yeah, I know, I know. That's why. You see, I have to think forward if I want to get things done. But the reason why I think it's possible is that if the robot is compact and does the surgery, you know, and you have now a visualization system, you know, you don't, in about five years, even probably before, you don't really need a microscope. You just need a video camera on top of the eye. So you've eliminated the big piece of equipment. Why do we need a large OR? You know, the sterility in the OR is much better if you use a laminar flow air system that is purified than if you sit in an OR because you're generating, you know, uh, cells that are covered with bacteria all the time. While if you have a laminar flow system of air, that, that would be even more sterile. So the whole concept of surgery, if, you, if you're looking at it from the standpoint of sterility, access this would demand more automation but we could have a surgical suite in an existing room essentially yeah 
And this in COVID time is also very important, you know, I mean, it makes very contemporary argument. I see there is someone who wants to talk, has been uh, granted access. Um, okay. Dr. Khaled, can you please uh, ask your question? Yeah, hi, Marco, and hi, Mark. This is Khaled Sabti from Kuwait. Hi. I have, hi. I had a, a great chance to uh, use the, uh, the demo at the Academy a few months ago, if you That's remember. Great. Yes, I yes, really yes. enjoyed it. I love this technology. I think this is the future. And I think my personal opinion that it is going to change how we treat CRVOs. I think the reason why we are not doing surgery because we are not able to uh, uh, successfully canalize the vein and inject whatever antithrombotic agent. I think if we have the chance using this technology to have a high success rate of catalyzing the vein and injecting whatever uh, stuff inside the vein to dis, uh, dis, uh, dissolve the clot, I think we may uh, change, this may change the future of treating CRVO. So Mark, thank you very much for making this technology available and I, I'm really looking forward to use it in the near future. So I think for CRVO, but also BRVO, if it's not a small vein in the very far periphery, you know, um, in uh, Barcelona, um, uh, Garcia Rumi showed that if you do delaminate and get rid of the occlusion, it doesn't reform and you can get improvement in vision. So I think, you know, um, we can get down to veins of about uh, 60 microns in diameter. The question is, is what we have to use as the, uh, to inject. And um, I mentioned what I showed you was with uh, Jetrea. Problem with that is that it's a very powerful enzyme. If it gets under the retina, it tends to eat it up. Uh, TPA can work if it's early enough, but the problem with TPA is that it needs a uh, uh, profibrinogen in the area. And if it doesn't, it's not able to create, in fact, uh, no, sorry. Uh, yeah, it needs fiber. Oh, I, I'm completely messed up right now. In order to be able to create plasmin, you need to have the right enzymes. And uh, that's not so easy. It has to come from a source. And, um, and TPA can only work essentially on uh, the pro-drug. Thank you. I think Khaled, I have has, used, Khaled has an experience in that. Maybe he can share it with us. I have used TBA in few patients uh, at early stages, and it did work uh, very well. But, you know, the, the chance of successfully canalizing a vein, uh, in my hand, it's not more than 30%. So one yeah. in three, you can make a successful, especially of cases where it's non-dilated veins, you, it's very difficult. So I, I think using this technology, it's going to give us access to unaccessible veins, and then we can inject whatever, whatever we uh, uh, works. And I think it's going to change the how we treat so this. These. Early July, we're going to test some steel needles uh, on the central retinal vein in the pig to see if we can uh, optimize the software. So we may have something that could work uh, in the very near future. I, I've used a steel needle uh, 58 uh, gauge cannula mm -hmm. in my cases. And it, they work very well. Uh, so I, the, I think I showed you a video on yes. that. So Academy. we're going to test. We're going to test those needles with the robot. So come back to me in the fall, and we can talk about that. Sure. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Great presentation. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Kelly. Thank, Thank you, Mark. Thank you for your comments. I think, Mark, we reached the end of the session because we're already past the eight. Uh, if there is anybody who wants to ask a question to Mark, now is the moment. Otherwise, we will uh, call it a day. No, no other questions? Then, Mark, thank you very much for being with us, to take the time for being with us. You know that it's always a huge pleasure to have you here and to, to make jokes with you and to see your face. And uh, um, thanks for, uh, for what you share with us. The technology is exciting and I tried to bring it in the past to Kekesh, so I will, I will even try harder now. <laughs> and uh, all of you guys that were here, Adel, you saw it, so you can also put a very good word with our CEO for this. <laughs> so, you know, thank you very much, Mark. I always like to work with you, as you know, and it's a pleasure to be able to, if it's at, even though it's at a distance like this, to interact with the people in Kekesh. I've been uh, doing this for years with uh, people over there, and it's always been a pleasure.
And when Marco was wondering whether he should go, I encouraged him to do it in part because of the, the fact that I've never been able to do that. So, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I, I send you my better part. You got the better part of me. And thank the, you. If anybody has the, questions, the feel looking, free to go. The better looking part, you mean? No, no, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. <laughs> so in any case, um, if anybody has questions, feel free to reach out to me. And, uh, you know, it'd be nice to continue this, uh, this uh, you know, um, process if we can. Yes, yes. Okay, they, you, they know how to find you and we threw the precise email. I think you put it at the end. At yes, the exactly. Of the yeah. Yeah. And, and the same uh, if uh, through you or through, you or know. through me, you can, you if you can, can reach, to, to reach yeah. Mark, I have all this, this mailing address. Yeah. Okay. Mark, have a nice evening, have a good everybody. Evening. Yes. Be careful. Bye. Stay bye -bye. safe. Yeah, bye. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.